Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second segment of On the Front Lines Interface Response to COVID-19. So happy to have such an incredible group here today. I'm Kelsey Buck Lilac, Director of Development here at Interfaith Community Services. And uh, the outpouring of support from you all has truly been incredible. It is our partnerships with people like you that make this important work possible. So thank you, thank you uh, for joining us today for all that you do for Interfaith. Um, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the webinar is scheduled for one hour, so approximately the first half will include presentations from interfaith leadership and our partner Neighborhood Healthcare, with the remainder dedicated to questions and answers. You can find the question and answer box on the bottom of your screen. Click the More tab if it isn't visible in your bottom taskbar. Any technical issues can be submitted in the Q&A box and someone will answer directly or you can call Jay at 760-803-1498. I think he just chatted that in the chat bar as well. Um, you are welcome to submit questions throughout the program and they'll be answered in the second half of the webinar. There's an option to submit questions anonymously, otherwise we will read your name as they're answered. Uh, lastly, the webinar is being recorded, but attendees are not visible. So I'd like to introduce our CEO, Greg Angel. A lot of you know Greg. So today Greg is going to introduce us to the people on the front lines at our Interfaith Cone Center headquarters in Escondido. Each person will share specifics about the various types of services being offered Monday through Friday to the men, women, and children who are coming to Interfaith for help. Greg. Thank you, Chelsea. And hey, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. We're so excited to have you here at the Betty and Melvin Cone Center headquarters, Interfaith's headquarters here in Escondido. I'm outside because that's where pretty much all the action is these days. We have completely modified pretty much everything we do to meet the needs of our community, to help people in this time of crisis, and to do so safe, socially distanced, and yes, masked. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick pan of um, the uh, parking lot where I am. And throughout the time that I'm on camera, you may see a little bit of kind of odd movement because I want to be very careful to not have anyone uh, on camera who hasn't agreed to be. Um, so here's a little pan of what's going on. You can see behind, we have uh, cars lined up behind me. All of those cars are actually here for food assistance. Uh, food assistance, you see some food donations being unloaded right now. We're gonna talk more about what else is going on here. And everything that we do, as so many of you know, because we have a lot of volunteers and a lot of um, longtime volunteers on the call today, uh, everything we do is driven by volunteer support. And so I'm going to introduce our volunteer services manager now, Mickey Hickox. Mickey's going to talk a little bit about how volunteers and staff are meeting food needs. And while she talks, because she's in her office inside, I'm going to uh, show us through the pantry and some areas, and uh, you'll be able to see what's going on. So with that, I will turn it over uh, to Mickey Hickox. Mickey. Hi, I'm so glad to hear so many volunteers are on the call today. I'm Mickey, I'm here in my office, but Greg is out in our pantry and we're gonna give you a quick tour so you can see what volunteers are doing now to support the um, increasing number of people we're helping in our food pantry and through our food pantry. And we're also gonna show you some of the needs we have. So we have four volunteers now in the pantry um, for social distancing. They wear masks, they wear gloves, Greg mentioned that as well. And the, they have four stations in the pantry. One person is in the hygiene area, two are on either sides of the pantry table, and then one is a runner. You might see um, on the video that we have bags. So what we are doing now is pre-packaging bags of essential food items so we know that food is getting distributed equitably to all people who need it. And last um, week that was over 1,700 people. So um, we stacked those uh, bags with essential items such as canned fruit and vegetables, tuna, chicken, beans, tomatoes. We throw in a jar of peanut butter 
and hopefully a bag of dried pasta. Those are lined up on the pantry tables and we do about 50 to 70 bags before each pantry session. And so when we get a pantry order from our supportive services team, a pantry volunteer, if it's a one to two individuals or families, we will grab one bag. If it's three to four and more, two bags, they start putting some other extra items in there. Things that we find in our own pantries all the time, but they might be lacking right now, such as cereal, breakfast items, snacks, crackers, uh, dried fruit, nuts, um, and loaves of bread. Thanks to Bimbo's and Costco, we have been filled, our shelves have been filled with bread and uh, two volunteers, Jim and Ron, who have been here for 15 years making sure we have bread. So the volunteers then also do a shout out to the volunteer who's back in the hygiene area, lets them know what hygiene items people need. They may need a toothbrush, toothpaste, deodorant, shampoo, detergent, um, they may need diapers, anywhere from size one to, to the pull-ups, baby wipes, everybody needs TP these days, or some of us do, paper towels, even dog and cat food. So the, the volunteer in that hygiene area is going to pull together all of those, those items. We're going to add them to the essential bag and make sure that everyone in their household, including their pets, is covered. And then the runner is going to take those bags. They usually do more than one order at a time, one order on the top of the cart, one order on the bottom. They will pull that outside. If we have available whole fruits, they're going to put a bag of whole fruits on the cart to make sure that people are getting some of the donated fruits that our growers are providing to us. We also have partners such as San Diego Food Bank, Feeding San Diego, um, Vista and Escondido Unified School Districts have been great in giving us supplemental items. We will put, add those to the bags, a bag of supplemental items when we have those ready to distribute. And then the pantry volunteer will take the cart out to the car. The, um, the person um, here for food will um, open their trunk or open the side door. We uh, pack those and unload the groceries into their car and away they go and we know they have food for the next few days at least. So uh, that is how a pantry worker now is helping us. We have really uh, been adaptable and innovative in the ways that we are providing, like I mentioned, over eight, an increase of eight times more people than we had in the past. So I wanna share kind of a warm story with this. And I forgot to mention, we also have sack lunches. So many of our volunteers who have been here are, are creating sack lunches for us and building sack lunches. We give one in the morning and, um, and another, we give actually two, one in for the morning and one for lunchtime. And then we always have sack lunches in the pantry. So why, you wonder probably why we are um, giving sack lunches in the morning. We had to shut down our morning soup kitchen providing hot meals and that was probably one of the saddest days for us here at Interfaith. But three volunteers, Dave Schmidt, Rick Mullins and Dave Geary step forward, uh, they're Kiwanis, so that's, that's um, common for them to do, and said, hey, we will help you. And we came around, uh, the team brainstormed, and we decided we're gonna do breakfast burritos. So Dave, Rick and Dave got together with our head chef, Bill. He showed them how to do a breakfast burrito, and they are in our kitchen between 4 and 4.30 a.m. every Friday morning, chopping onions and peppers, um, sauteing meats, putting um, tater tots in the oven, getting everything together in the egg mixture, sprinkling some cheese in there, scrambling up the eggs, and then we roll them in donated tortillas and then in foil, put them in a bag along with a bag of cookies and some fruit. And people are so happy to at least get one warm breakfast now uh, during the week at Interfaith. So all, again, innovation, adaptability, every day is different. But we so appreciate our volunteers, whether they can be with us now or they're waiting to come back. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the, rest of the webinar. And um, if you need more information, go to Get Involved at, send an email at getinvolved.interfaceservices.org. Wow. Thank you, Mickey. And, oh, no. uh, and thank you to all of our volunteers and our staff and our community partners. I mean, you can see just how much activity is going on here. Um, and, it's, and it's to meet uh, a 400% increase in demand for uh, basic needs food services that we've seen since the COVID crisis uh, began 
last month. Um, those of you on the call, a lot of you have been supporting us for a long time. You know that we were started by different faith communities coming together, uh, people of diversity and people of compassion. And we wanna share a little bit about uh, how those communities are helping beyond the ways you just saw. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to our faith relations manager, Alona Beyer. Alona? Hi everyone, my name is Ilona Bayer. I'm the Faith Relations Manager here, and I get the wonderful privilege to work with all of our faith communities and their congregation members. Since everything has started, we have continued to receive the support from many of the members through different means, some of them being drive-by food drives where people drop off food from their, um, with their cars. We've received individuals coming in to help and volunteer. And we've also received donations via online purchases. Some faith centers have gathered together, gathered some funds and placed a big order on Walmart or Amazon and have had it shipped directly here to Interfaith, which has allowed us to continue meeting the need of, of the individuals coming to seek services. One of the volunteer opportunities that many of um, the individuals have been coming to participate in is bulk repackaging. I'm gonna turn over my camera so you guys can see what I'm talking about. We have lots of items that have been donated by many of the supporters, including diapers, we've got salt, we've got sugar, we've got dog food. And many of these items have become necessary because um, with the increased number and high demand of orders coming in through our pantry, our pantry is not able to fulfill all those orders and break up down, break down these items to hand out to all of the families in need. So when these bigger items come in, we have volunteers who are here helping us break down those items into smaller packages. That way they can be given to more families. Some of these items include things like Tide Pods. Individuals can come in and break these down into smaller baggies of four, and we're able to hand those out to more families. Another item are feminine hygiene products. They often come in big packages, and we're able to separate them into smaller ones, so that way we can meet the need for more individuals. We also have some volunteers back here right now. They're working on, and Natasha's working on doing some diapers, getting those ready for families. Tony is working on breaking down some rice, so they're back here helping out, getting those items ready for many people in need. So that's one way that individuals are coming to help here at Interfaith. Um, before I finish up, I just wanted to share one great thing that I've experienced being able to work here at Interfaith and with our faith communities through all of this, and that is the power of communication and just spreading the word. Many of you sitting at home today, you have lots of friends and family who are asking how they can help and just share with them about what Interfaith is doing. I personally had the experience of starting out by working with one faith member who was looking to find out how to get involved. Her and her family made sack lunches for us, which then another friend asked her how they can help. And just yesterday, I received a fourth call, a fourth generation of individuals sparking from that first person looking to help. And they're gonna be providing hygiene kits for us here in, in about a week. And so, through that power of communication, we're really able to help those in need. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Ilona. And uh, most of all, thank you to all of our faith communities and all of our supporters. You are helping uh, our community in a time of truly unprecedented crisis. Uh, to talk about how we go beyond the basic needs support and get at the underlying causes and address some of the other uh, bigger issues around uh, rent, around finances, around employment, around housing. I'm going to introduce now uh, an amazing colleague, uh, our Director of Supportive Services, Veronica Blea. And while Veronica talks, uh, I will uh, uh, walk us through and show a little bit more of what's going on. Veronica. Thanks, Greg. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, like Greg said, we, we definitely, as you can see outside, we've shifted um, how we provide services. Um, a lot of those vehicles are here for food, but some of them are here for other services, right? So we, um, we're we also offering drive up services for taxes. So as you come in, um, you can drop off your taxes. We're doing we're doing them virtually as well, which is really cool. Um, and I think, you know, we all feel like it's really important to keep that going to make sure that people get their refund, especially right now. Um, as everyone struggles to kind of make ends meet, we want to um, 
ensure that we're able to, to support that. Part of that also is um, the stimulus, right? Um, individuals that haven't filed the tax return for 18 or 19 aren't um, able to, to tap into that. And so we're helping support um, logging into the IRS website to be able to do that. Um, another thing that we offer right now, I know that um, Mickey touched on it in the morning, our morning breakfast. Unfortunately, we did have to close down, but um, we are still offering showers and laundry. Um, again, we, we don't let anybody be, again, before everybody would just be able to come in and kind of hang out in the nutrition center. Unfortunately, right now we can't do that. So um, we're bringing people in one at a time to be able to provide those showers um, and laundry again, because of what's going on. Hygiene is so important. We definitely want to continue doing that. Um, so we are continuing that. We are offering face masks too as they come in. Um, also, we, um, we're doing our supportive services. So rental assistance, immigration services, um, the cl clients that uh, need employment or unemployment, we've actually seen a large spike in individuals who have been coming in asking for support applying for unemployment because they haven't done it in so long or they just don't know how. So we're, be we're able to walk them through it, whether that's over the phone or um, they're coming in and we're social distancing. We're having them in an office and we're in a separate location and we're talking on the phone, things of that nature. We've been having to get super creative and uh, uh, it's been neat to see the innovation kind of happen within the team, just different things, um, different ideas coming from all over the place. Um, another thing that we've actually changed is our senior services. Again, we want to make sure that our senior population is staying safe. And so um, in order to do that, we've just increased our how are you calls. We're checking in um, with our seniors on a daily basis and we've gotten really good responses. Um, so sometimes we just want to talk to someone else and say, hey, like we're okay and everything's going good. Um, we've also been able to do drop-off services for food for our senior population and others in need. Um, and so we're able to pack, you know, those boxes and bags of food that Mickey showed earlier. Um, we're able to do that as well. What's been really cool is that we've been able to offer um, uh, virtual financial literacy classes um, and different, um, uh, just like uh, job skills, readiness courses and stuff, which has been neat. And what we'll do is we'll social distance. We'll have one individual on the far end, another on one end. And then we'll also have people logging in from their own um, devices, whether that's their phone um, or at home at their computer, which has been um, super fun to do. We did our first couple this month and those are fun. Um, we uh, were, our Haven House is still open. Um, that's our, our partner's neighborhood healthcare and David will talk about them in just a minute. But um, uh, our Haven House is still open. We have had to reduce, unfortunately, our beds just to ensure safety and social distancing. So uh, we currently only have um, 20 beds available, but um, we're bringing people in safely and slowly. So we'll um, bring new individuals in. We'll have them checked by our partners, Neighborhood Healthcare, and then we'll also have them in our isolation room. Uh, we're super fortunate to have that ability to do right there on site. We have a separate bunk house where we're able to isolate um, individuals that are just coming in for five to seven days just to ensure that they're not showing any symptoms uh, and then we'll invite them into uh, into Haven. Uh, we changed the, the get down at Haven. We're open 24 hours so that means clients don't have to leave during the day. Again that's uh, to promote sheltering in place. This is their home so we want them to definitely feel like they have a place where they can shelter in place. Well and we're gonna have we're gonna have some time for Q&A uh, after our next presenter. Uh, so, so if you have questions, go ahead and type those into the uh, chat box and, and we'll uh, be sure to get to them. Uh, we want to make a little time for uh, one of our newest colleagues and partners, uh, and that's Neighborhood Healthcare. And so I'd like to uh, introduce David Sierra, who is the, who is the, uh, the site supervisor for our health center. He's outside. You saw him a minute ago. While he talks, I'm going to walk over to the health center here indoors. David. Hi, how's it going, everyone? Good afternoon. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay. If not, let me know. Um, but yes, I'm, my name is David Sierra. I'm the site supervisor manager for Neighborhood Healthcare located inside our partner's facility interface here in Escondido. Um, and the purpose of our the integ integration of our facility in here is to provide a more holistic and complete kind of care to our clients and patients coming in. Um, there was definitely a need. There's definitely a need and a demand there. Um, so we wanted to fill that need. And this is how we do it. Um, as you can see on the screen, you'll see one of our MAs, Veronica, and our, um, and our provider, Daphne, a couple of stations right there. Um, so the kind of the services that we provide are basic services such as 
walking in for an urgent care issue, if you have a minor cut, if you have bleeding, if you have a cough, fever, any of those things. And then also we do provide um, establishment care um, situations to where um, our clients and our patients that are coming in and they want to settle in and have a provider that they can come to and trust, we provide that, uh, that service as well. Um, and currently with the whole situation with COVID-19, as, as Greg walked by earlier, we're outside screening everybody that comes to the door, whether it be coming for services from Interfaith um, or it be coming in for medical services from us. Everybody gets screened so that we maintain social distancing, um, safety, and any COVID testing that, that our provider deems necessary. Um, a couple of ways to really get a hold of us is obviously our online page has our information and our location here. And then you can also dial in directly and that numbers are generally available to anybody and anyone. But I think that the main purpose for our partnership with Interfaith here was to really provide a much deserved needed service to this specific population that sometimes just doesn't know where to go or do know where to go but don't have the transportation or have a difficult time getting somewhere. Um, and because we have a lot of that population congregate here at, at Interfaith because of the great work that they do, it just makes sense for us to partner, partner together finally and provide a, a full service from beginning to end. Um, and I think that's really something that I myself am very, very proud of. I'm a big advocate of helping those, those most in need. And actually that's one of our, that's our mission statement to provide, to, to serve the underserved. Um, and I think this population definitely falls into that category. Um, I think that one of uh, a very touching story that happened a couple, maybe about a month and a half ago, we had uh, a client come in for services here from Interface. The gentleman was uh, wet, dirty, and he had a cough. So through providing the services to Interface, they actually recommended him to be seen by our provider as well. So he came in, we saw him uh, medically, and we took care of him. We were able to prescribe him some medication give him a good treatment plan. And then we also noticed that he was wet, that he was you know, not in the best hygiene available or possible. So we also reached out back to Interfaith and said, what can we do for this person and what can we provide him with? So from, the gentleman came in in one state and when he walked out, he had clean clothes, he had a medical treatment plan, he had a brand new primary care physician, he had received um, shelter services from Interfaith. And those kind of things, even though that story itself is very touching, that speaks to what happens all the time with this new partnership that we have. We're able to really supply and give help from beginning to A, from A to Z to everybody that comes in. Um, and I think that's the strength of our partnership, really. Being able to be a one-stop shop for the, for the community that most needs. Thank you so much, David. Uh, really appreciate your partnership. Appreciate you taking time. Uh, everyone who's spoken today for taking time out of their exceptionally busy days. Um, as we've talked about on this call, we are, uh, and this is just an a in-depth uh, look at our Escondido headquarters, we are absolutely uh, slammed for requests for services uh, North County wide where we are serving. Um, we wanted to give you a, an opportunity to learn more and see more about some of the basic needs support here. Uh, you heard from Veronica how we are also providing tax assistance, beginning to make connections around rental assistance, employment, financial literacy, all part of our helping people help themselves model to get them through a tough time. And to be able to have healthcare professionals here on site has been a wonderful support this last year. We've had neighborhood healthcare here a little over a year, but to now have it amidst this crisis where we can con conduct uh, COVID-19 tests on site uh, is even more important. I'm standing in front of the Joan and Lee James Recovery and Wellness Center uh, at the, the far end of our, of our headquarters. And we have a 49 bed uh, residential treatment and detox program here for individuals overcoming addiction and mental health issues. And thanks to our partnership with Neighborhood Healthcare, just as this uh, webinar was starting, every resident of the program was getting uh, a very quick health screening to see if they have any symptoms related to COVID as we uh, inst institute every precaution we can to both continue to provide services when they're needed, but also do so in the safest way possible. Um, so that is a quick uh, rundown of what's going on here. Um, 
if you've seen me uh, walking through some of the parking lot, I'm going to flip the camera around one more time here. Um, uh, you may see that uh, when, when Veronica was talking about taxes, uh, that I, I showed the taxes parking spaces. It's because we have different parking spaces in every part of the lot and our amazing staff working at our front gate meet with everybody as they, as they drive up, find out what's going on and then connect them to the right space to get that assistance. It's an all hands on deck uh, uh, effort right now. Uh, we have a member of our accounting team actually greeting everybody uh, when they come in today. Um, we are uh, really working um, across the agency to continue to provide essential services. And we're only able to do that thanks to your support, the support of this community for the last 40 years, creating interfaith community services and sustaining our most essential services in this time of great need. So uh, that's what's happening here. Uh, also here in Escondido, we are managing 80 motel rooms for unsheltered individuals who are uh, older than 65 or have chronic health conditions. So those are an additional 80 households that we have in shelter who were previously homeless here in Escondido. We have another 40 rooms on the coast in Carlsbad and are doing a lot of what you see here, basic needs assistance, rental assistance, helping people uh, on our coastal communities, um, uh, though in a, a little smaller way since we don't have quite the facility there that we have here. I wanted to give you all a sense of that as well. All right, that's enough from us. We'd love to hear from you and we wanna answer your questions. I'm gonna turn it over to Chelsea and I'm gonna head into our uh, nutrition center so I can have uh, a place to uh, hear what, what you all would like to know about and we'll answer all the questions that we can. Chelsea. Wow, thank you, Greg. Thank you, David, Veronica, Ilona, and Mickey. Incredible, incredible work. Um, questions are rolling in. So here we go, guys. I will read them as they come in. Uh, please feel free to continue to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, let's see, first question is, how many people on average does Interfaith serve each day? Yeah, before this time, we would see 30 to 45 households on um, a typical entire day just here at our Escondido Center for the basic needs walk-in assistance that we've spent a lot of time talking about today. Uh, amidst this crisis, we are seeing as many as 600 people a day for that same service. This morning, we saw 40 to 60 uh, families come just in the morning service. So we're seeing a significant uh, increase and that's just for the basic needs assistance. I mentioned our detox program. We operate one of the only uh, detox programs for individuals who are low income uh, and homeless in the entire county. And we are absolutely inundated with requests and individuals seeking out that life-changing program right now. So we're seeing really uh, high levels of demand. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we have some great questions. Thank you, Darren, for, for your question. Uh, some good questions from Alice around uh, food and pantry service. Are you keeping track of people who receive pantry items and how many are they limited to each month? So, um just because of the current situation, so we are tracking it. We're definitely getting, um, you know, family size, uh, basic information, but we're trying to make it as easy as possible for individuals to come in. You know, it's, I would say, I think it was mid-March, we had a family come in. It was her first time accessing any type of services. She was super nervous, super nervous. She had her kids in the back and she's like, I've never done this before. I'm not sure if I want to. And so I think it was really reassuring to her. You know, the team was like, the worries is what we're here for, come on in. And so I think it was reassuring to know that she just had to give some basic demographics if it was her first time. So we are tracking that. And because of the situation, we don't want to limit it. If people are hungry, we want to feed them. We're definitely not um, going to close the door on anyone. Uh, Greg, we hear from the governor about an Operation Key Lock. Do you know what is happening with that? That question comes from Lou. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a reference to the plan to use uh, hotel rooms to provide shelter to unsheltered uh, uh, individuals. And I mentioned we have 120 hotel rooms that we're doing that in right now. And we're also working with our elected leaders to create a plan uh, longer term to actually begin purchasing those motels. The hospitality industry, like a lot of industries, has been absolutely um, uh, 
crushed by this, uh, this pandemic uh, economically. And uh, what that means is there will be opportunities to purchase some uh, blighted motels. And we're really looking at motels that are frankly um, uh, problems in our community that, that, are, that are often hotspots for criminal activity and ways that we can purchase those motels and turn a blighted um, place uh, into a place of healing and restoration. So we'll be doing that in partnership with um, local council members, mayors, county supervisors, and absolutely uh, the state of California, because there will be resources to create more short-term and long-term housing, and it's very needed. Thank you, Greg. Another question around, uh, around political leadership and decisions that they're Do you know if the governor is extending the no eviction order? The no eviction order, uh, as I understand it, goes through the end of May, although it also has been a local issue in many instances. So it's also driven by our local municipalities and by the county. Um, the problem is no matter what the delay is, they could delay it until August. Um, they're not forgiving uh, rent. And so um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the community members who, who are here for food um, are, are by and large um, making it by um, on a on a month to month basis and 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 going months without uh, without income, uh, a lot of people are going to be so far behind that they're going to have just a, a cascade of um, of bills come due at the same time. So whether that moratorium is lifted at the end of May, the end of June, the end of July, um, there will be assistance needed. Uh, Veronica, um, you know we're we're well positioned to help families in that time. Can you talk uh, a little bit about how we? provide rental assistance now and just what an in-depth process it is and the case management that goes with it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, like Greg said, we have been seeing uh, an influx of individuals who are going to, who already need multiple months, right? We're looking at March and April. And so um, what the case managers do is if we're able um, and the client is comfortable, we'll do a Zoom call, um, just kind of get an idea of what's going on. We, we do ask for, um, uh, three-day pay or quit or some type of information so that we can follow up with the landlord um, to kind of get an idea of what's happening and if the landlord's willing to work with us. We've had really, really good luck with all the landlords. Um, and I think that right now, because of the moratorium, there's not a sense of urgency. And so the um, the clients are like, are a little less tense about it. They're able to come in a couple of times, um, talk to a case manager, whether that's in their vehicle and we're giving them the documentation that they need to fill out. Um, we had a, a, a senior client, she was 71. If you guys got a chance to read our newsletter that went out, I don't know if it's gotten to everyone yet, but we talked about this client in there. Um, she was a senior client and um, uh, she was nervous to come out of her house. She's on social security. She was working at a Walmart as a cashier, but had to stop once this all happened, right? And so um, she, she came in for services. Again, she was super scared. She came in once and she's like, I don't wanna go back. So our case manager actually went out delivered the documentation to the client. Um, within like an hour, the, the client had sent back the documentation through the landlord. So the landlord helped her out, sent it all over, um, and we were able to provide uh, assistance for the client. The client called uh, the case manager the other day, just super excited and said that she had shared it with one of her uh, neighbors over the phone. And so um, just yesterday, the neighbor had called. I was like, I, you know, I heard you guys are doing wonderful things. I, I really need some help, another senior as well. And so we're hoping to, to, to help that individual um, with rental assistance coming up here soon. But again, like Greg was saying, like we do see multiple months and we're able to support that. Um, we do, we look at the situation uh, and we try to support as much as we possibly can. Wow, thank you, Veronica. What, a, what an awesome story there. Um, we have someone on the call who has a disability and has been calling around to places who might be able to deliver food. Uh, wondering if, if and how Interfaith can help. Veronica, can you speak to that? Yeah, my, um, our, senior, our senior team is going out on a regular basis. Um, I would say uh, give me a call or, or email me directly and, and we can definitely see how we can, we can get some food out there for you and other resources that you might need. Okay, a couple questions around volunteering. Uh, is there currently an age limit for volunteering? Are people 65 and over allowed to volunteer? Uh, there is no age limit. Of course, you'd have to, if you were a child, you would be with one of your parents or an adult. 
Uh, we like to see families get involved, especially right now. We think with kids out of school, this is a great learning lesson for them to help. As far as 65 or older, we're very cautious about that, but there's things you can do at home. There, you can come into uh, our, our development area and help with the bulk items that Alona mentioned. So there are some options for you and definitely a lot of things you can do in your own space. So if you go to interfaithservices.org slash volunteer, there's a list of things, but you can again also send us an email and we'd love to have a conversation. Thank you, Mickey. A uh, quick question in the chat bar about bulk item repacking. Someone is asking, could we help with the bulk item repacking at our church? Maybe pick up some bulk supplies and then return them as individual packages. We typically ask that individuals who want to volunteer bulk repackaging from home provide those items themselves, um, either by purchasing them or soliciting donations from their friends of those items repackage at home and then drop off. Part of the reason for this is that we're never able to predict what items we're going to have available to repackage, nor whether we'll have items that day. And so that's not something that we can necessarily plan ahead for because all the items that we get in, we try to repackage them really quickly so that way we can get them out into our pantry and meet the needs. So for those individuals wanting to help at home, we ask if you're able to to go ahead, drop by the store and pick up some of those items that are great are our greatest needs and do that from home. Thank you, Ilona. Um, I have a question from Cassandra. What kind of mental health services does neighborhood health care and or interfaith provide? Um, so we do provide um, therapy and psychiatric so med management. We do provide both. Um, I'm a firm believer that that I think we all need therapy at one point of our lives, right? Especially when you're, when you're going through a lot of stuff, um, especially this population that comes here, they're going through a lot of stuff already. So therapy was one of those things that we just had to make sure that we had here. And then you also have a lot of people that are um, that have been on medications on and off or whatnot. So that was another important thing. We have psychiatry on site um, in, 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 one, in one form or the other to be able to, again, completely take care of a patient from the beginning of the end. So we do provide psychiatry and therapy. Thank you, David. Uh, it's it's an amazing partnership we have with Neighborhood Healthcare, where their behavioral health providers are able to provide uh, a remarkable baseline level of care. And then, if an individual needs a level of care in addition to that, um, one of our areas of expertise is connecting people with other available programs and resources that are out there. So, right now, um, in my office, kind of around the corner, uh, is a, a team from Exodus. Um, uh, mental health outreach and and they operate a program called whole person care where the county of San Diego um, helps individuals who are high utilizers of hospitals and um, and, uh, and and of other community resources primarily due to homelessness with untreated mental health conditions and so um, that team is here today because they're working with individuals who are in the motels that we're managing because a lot of the people who are in the motels that we're managing right now, the 120 rooms, um, fit that criteria. They've been on the streets a long time. They have a lot of health conditions, uh, physical health and mental health. And so we're able to provide um, really high level uh, uh, mental health and psychiatric services to those individuals. Um, and then uh, we're very fortunate, thanks to you, our donors, for your support, because you fund person-centered mental health clinicians that can see people regardless of uh, what they qualify for, and uh, whether they're in a, a, a treatment program like our Recovery and Wellness Center, which is right behind me, behind this wall, or they're just somebody walking in for services, and we can make connections uh, to neighborhood healthcare and other resources. It's a, a big part of what we do. Thank you, Greg. Um, our, we have a question from Alice. Are all the services that used to be offered from 8 to 11 in the morning and 1 to 3 in the afternoon now available all day, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5? Veronica, you want to answer that? Yeah, so um, yes, we've done them. They're all drive-up services now. Of course, with some alterations, like for example, we can't give out clothing vouchers because right now our, um, our partner agency that we would send them to is closed. And so, um, and for example, we would give DMV slips so that people could go get free IDs. Unfortunately, we can't do that right now because the DMV is closed. So everything that we can possibly pr provide, for example, prescription assistance, we still provide that. Um, you know, we're still helping obviously with food and hygiene, rental assistance. 
uh, any type of basic need that we're able to provide, we are providing that in the mornings and in the afternoons as well, 8 to 11 from, and 1 to 3. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Jill. Hello, Jill. And uh, thank you for all the sweet comments also, uh, guys. She says, everything you all are doing is amazing. What is the current status of our recovery program and residential program? You spoke to that a little bit. Uh, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, our 49-bed program uh, includes normally 38 beds of, of residential treatment, uh, 90 days um, for anybody, regardless of their ability to pay, and 11 beds of detox. We have reduced that capacity by 10 beds to create a quarantine room, which is actually the room right behind me. Um, and uh, we, we call it the bunkhouse here. And I'm not sure if she made it on the call or not, but I saw on the registration list that our founding executive director, Suzanne Pullman, uh, was going to join us today. And, uh, and so Suzanne could tell you just how many ways we've used the bunkhouse over the years to help people um, overcome homelessness and, and, uh, and, 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 and really rebuild their lives. Well, right now it's being used, uh, it used to be used for detox. Right now it's our quarantine room. So if somebody is, is, is here and they're in our treatment program or they're over in the shelter, like you saw, and they become symptomatic uh, and perhaps may have COVID-19, we're able to say, we're able to place them into the, the bunkhouse until they can get medical treatment. And then if they do need to, they can move into an isolation motel room a whole different resource that the County of San Diego has set up. So um, we've actually reduced the size of the treatment program, the Recovery Wellness Center, to be able to accommodate that. Uh, we do still have uh, nearly uh, 40 individuals in the treatment program, in our residential treatment program and our detox, uh, and that's for uh, all genders. Um, that's here on site. And then we're also operating outpatient treatment services, largely telephonically and virtually. So um, we're doing those outpatient services. We provide interim housing for graduates of the program. And um, of course, everything that we do is about uh, helping people help themselves. So connecting to employment and establishing income for longer term self-reliance is a, is a huge part of all of that. And it's continuing. Uh, and we're continuing to take new individuals in um, uh, as well. A uh, question from Bonnie about uh, protective masks. Do you have a preferred mask style for donated homemade face masks? Um, she gave an example, surgeon style like Greg is wearing versus fitted. People are donating various uh, masks, the kind that kind of fit snugly over your nose, the kind that uh, Veronica has with elastic. A lot of people like the elastic around the ears. Uh, we have ties so they fit um, children to um, adults. So we really, whatever you've made, we are taking and we're using, we're distributing those to our clients, whether they're drive-through, whether they're a client in our recovery programs, to our volunteers and to our staff. So we go through a lot of masks. We use a lot, some of us like to coordinate them with our outfits and, um, and we will take whatever you have and, and, and we will use them. It's a major need for us. Like Mickey said, we are distributing, and Veronica said it earlier, distributing masks to everybody. Beginning tomorrow, it's the law in San Diego County that if you are outside of your home, you need to be wearing a mask. So we're gonna make sure that everyone we're working with has those masks, and the only way we can do that is through donations. So um, yeah, please do encourage people who are able to procure them and donate them, able to make them and donate them um, to, to do so. And other donations of, of personal protective equipment is really critical. We um, are still uh, very short on hand sanitizer. We have enough, but we don't know how long it will last. And um, one of our, our board members the other day said uh, that uh, when she was working in the food pantry, it was like the story of loaves and fishes, that every time she thought we were out of something, she turned around and it had just been refilled by a new donation. That really seems to be how our, our PPE is getting replenished these days. Just when we think we're gonna run out of hand sanitizer or disinfectant wipes, or masks, more donations come in. And that is the history of interfaith community services. And we like to think it's um, a reflection of the, the wisdom of, of bringing all people and all faiths together in this work. Um, and we really do need that continued support. Uh, if it hasn't already been put up in the chat window, we can uh, share the list of all the in-kind items and, and, and those, uh, those uh, personal protective equipment needs as well. We have Bonnie asking, can luncheon sandwiches be made at home now and then delivered? 
Um, she's aware that there has been restrictions before as far as how food can be and where food can be prepared. Yeah, sure. So, um, so the, of course, the, the regulations now are that all food that is distributed to the public needs to be made in a commercial kitchen. Um, we're very thankful to have a commercial kitchen here. Um, you can see it uh, behind me. Uh, and you saw it when I was uh, walking through earlier. So um, volunteers can come and make those here on site. Um, volunteers can also make them in uh, their own commercial kitchen or um, in uh, certain types of other settings. We can provide those details for you if you'd like, and they can come and donate them here. Um, and we will, we uh, of course are doing our best to make sure that we're adhering to all of the regulations while we also um, get uh, hundreds of sack lunches out the door every day. In particular, since we're no longer doing the hot meals most days of the week. So it's a little different, but uh, we're, we're, we're doing our best. Thank you, Greg. Uh, we have a question from Darren. Are you providing education or funding for education for the minors who come in for your- We, we do uh, have a transitional youth academy for high school age students, particularly in Oceanside and Carlsbad. We have nearly 100 high school age students and their families who we are working with. All, uh, almost 100 of those students, all the students who are working with have the equipment they need to be able to do the remote learning that is now happening. Uh, we know that because we are still working with every single one of those students and their families. Most of the families who are coming here to our Escondido Center for food assistance and for other needs, um, uh, education and, and how they're handling that really is not the, the, the top of mind issue that they're, um, that they're raising with us. Um, so I, I don't know how much we're having those conversations at this point in the crisis with the thousands of people who we're working with. Uh, Veronica, is there anything you want to say about um, any of the families who we are case managing and any educational issues uh, that you're seeing or that we're discussing? Um, I think in the beginning we had um, a, a couple of like questions that were raised, but um, we do have some resources of um, different things in the community of different um, nonprofits that are doing that exactly. Like so if, if a family has any issues of like connecting or doesn't, don't have the equipment and the district haven't been able to provide them yet, we're able to connect them there and, and make sure that they get that connection. So we do have resources for that. Um, is food distribution every day? Do families need to call before they come into the office? Uh, Monday through Friday, 8 to 11, uh, 1 to 3, and they don't need to call here at our uh, 550 location, but we are having um, individuals by appointment over at our Carlsbad Service Center. So that, that location you do have to call ahead, um, but here you do not. Wonderful, thank you, Veronica. Uh, question from Barbara, what seems to be the greatest need at this time? Basic food slash hygiene items, medical care, shelter or rental assistance? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All of the above? <laughs> sorry, sorry, no, um, I think uh, this week though, I got some feedback from my staff that um, we're not, we're still seeing obviously like a bunch of people coming in for food and hygiene, but not as much as we were a couple of weeks ago. I think maybe people are kind of getting um, uh, cow fresh. They're, they're starting to get like more, you know, more assistance coming in. And so they're, they're utilizing the supplement, which is wonderful, right? So the numbers aren't as heavy, but they're still obviously double, triple what we were seeing before. Um, definitely rental assistance, right? Like we're, we're seeing a lot of that just in, in the matter of a week, we've seen like 90 to 150 calls on a regular basis. So that's, that's definitely need, but uh, yes to all of those things. <laughs> yeah, and, and on, on rental assistance, um, I, I think it was referenced earlier, the amount of assistance that families are going to require is just going to be much greater than we have, uh, than we have traditionally provided. Uh, the, the amount of assistance we usually provide is that final gap funding that a family needs to, to preserve their housing. After we've uh, confirmed that they're going to be able to keep that housing, on an ongoing basis, and they're putting in almost all of it themselves, but they need an extra 500 or maybe $1,000 to close that gap. We're anticipating that need being uh, many times higher uh, when, uh, again, these cascade of, of, of unpaid bills come due 
uh, probably this summer. So we're really going to need financial assistance. Um, all of the things that we're doing now are costing a lot more. We have a lot of volunteers here now. In the early days, we had very few volunteers who were able to come in, and we still have far fewer than we did uh, than we do in normal times. And so we have a lot more staff doing this work. And then we're staffing not just a greater need, but we're staffing 24-7, uh, our Haven House shelter, the motels, all of these programs that, that didn't exist or operated completely differently just two months ago. And we're only able to do that because the community, so many people on this call have been so generous. And um, I, I cannot thank all of you enough for uh, for your support uh, during this time of, of truly unprecedented need. And, uh, and we're very thankful knowing that, that, that you and the rest of the community, that we're going to be here and that we're going to continue to do this work and continue to support the proven effective uh, interventions that can really help families during this, this time of crisis. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, everyone, for all of the wonderful questions. Again, I encourage you to kind of check out the chat bar for some other resources that are um, being shared there. Uh, most of the questions have been addressed at this point. Uh, we have a few minutes left. If, you, if there are any lingering questions, feel free to submit those in the Q&A box. Um, I'd like to just share a few that um, were already answered in the Q&A box that maybe others uh, did not see. We had someone, hello, Jerry, who asked about showers and laundry and how those are operating in the morning. Um, we are absolutely still offering them, but we are practicing social distancing and bringing individuals in one at a time. Um, if Veronica wants to add to that. Um, do you still provide hiring for day laborers, especially Spanish speaking folks? Yes, absolutely. Um, with employment at an all time high, we need employers, you know, more than ever to hire our day labor workers. Uh, so Jay shared a resource there. Um, if you have daily temporary or permanent job openings, um, our skilled laborers are available for improvement projects, painting, moving, yard work, construction clean up and more. So Jay will go ahead and share a phone number you can call for more information in our, our comment uh, section. Let me jump back and see if there's any other questions that have come in since. Uh, we have a couple people asking if there's a copy of the webinar recording available and absolutely there is. We are recording this live so we will follow up with each of you via email. We'll share a link to this recording as well as some other resources that we've been sharing throughout our hour together. Um, I encourage you to please share the recording with, with friends and family and other folks who you think would be interested in the work that um, we are all doing together. So um, I don't see any last minute questions. It's about 2.26. Uh, thank you again so very much for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Greg to sort of close us out and say goodbye. Awesome. Thank you, Chelsea. And uh, can we do like wherever you are listening to this, can we do a little round of applause for our amazing interfaith team, Chelsea, and the entire development team who worked tirelessly to, uh, to, to bring in the resources that are needed for this work. And they've done such a great job. Chelsea, Fiona, Jay, Jennifer, uh, Bob, our uh, chief development officer who was here today. He's been working from home, but I saw him. He, he made like a cameo appearance on the webinar. Um, they've done such amazing work. Our, our development team who's been doing the uh, supporting our, um, our social services staff with providing food assistance. Um, and uh, to our supportive services teams and all of our staff uh, who are doing this work, uh, they're working days, uh, uh, they're working without days off, they're working long hours, extra hours, our resident coordinators, our site security teams who are, um, you know, you may have seen them with security on the back of their shirt. Uh, it really, um, they're like the most people focused individuals you can imagine and they build trusting relationships with people in really challenging situations here and connect them in to treatment and services to our volunteers doing this work uh, and to all of you on the call we have like an all-star group on this uh, call um, I just saw uh, Pastor Hector Morales uh, give a shout out uh, Pastor Hector uh, is uh, hopefully going to be joining our board of directors in a little bit we have another future potential board member on the call I mentioned our founding executive director, Suzanne Pullman. Uh, my God, none of this exists without her 
starting us 40 years ago, she would be the first to say that none of this exists without all of you and all of the team uh, coming together in this community. Um, we cannot thank you enough. You are, you are feeding thousands of people. You are sheltering thousands of people. You are helping them in their, in their time of crisis. And, um, you know, unprecedented and words like that are thrown around every now and then, but they were like made for this, this, um, this world that we're in right now. And uh, to have uh, our neighborhood healthcare partnership and to be able to meet healthcare needs and to um, really be able to support uh, families who, like Veronica said, they've never been here before. They've never needed our assistance. Maybe they've been here to drop food off as a donation, but they're here for help for the first time. Your support uh, is, is truly a lifeline in a time of crisis. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to all of our faith leaders. Thank you to all of our volunteers, our donors, our supporters. Uh, we are going to need your help, of course, now more than ever, today and in the months and years ahead. It is an opportunity uh, to, um, to really not just help people who are impacted by this crisis, we all know that it's, that it's the lowest income, uh, most economically disadvantaged individuals who make our community run and who are now impacted more than, than anyone else by this. And you are here for them, you are helping them, and we're gonna have the opportunity in the years ahead to change how uh, we help even more and how we can change that equation. So a lot more to come. Thank you all of you for being here. Thank you for everyone who put this on. Uh, we will see you again. And uh, it, please do share this with your friends, family. And if you wanna learn more, reach out. And if you wanna set something up like this for a smaller group, we would love to do that. Uh, we'd love to put together something to show you this or other, other interfaith uh, programs in action. Thank you, you all are changing and saving lives. And I think uh, we're all gonna, all gonna say goodbye. Thank you everyone.